Why don't we just bow our heads and go back to the Lord in prayer for a second. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're in us and that you're among us. We acknowledge you, Lord Jesus. Our eyes, our hearts, our focus is set upon you, Lord. We intentionally this morning set our minds upon you, Jesus. We ask that you will be free to do all that you desire desire in our hearts. We ask for conformity into the image of yourself, Lord, on the inside, by your Spirit, that as we behold you, Spirit of the Lord, conform us, as we see you, truly see you with the veils removed, And we ask you to remove the veils, remove the veils of religion from our minds, from our hearts, from our understanding our backgrounds are in play in this, Lord. So many things we've heard or been taught or have seen or witnessed that was never your testimony, never your heart, never your will, never your purpose never truly displaying who you are. We give you permission, Lord, to deal with that in our own hearts, our environments, Lord, that we've been around or been a part of. Fire of God, burn those things and make ready. Prepare a way in us. Prepare a way in us for the Spirit's coming the Holy Spirit to come in your power and your fullness in your heart and your ways. Make us ready as a people. Make us ready internally speaking as a people. A people prepared for you yourself, Lord. A bride made ready. We ask for that this morning. Spirit of the Lord, that we would be baptized again in a fresh way, in a freshness of your presence, in the presence of fire, as was the promise, that we would be baptized in the Holy Spirit and in fire. And we ask for fresh immersion this morning, Holy Spirit, of your presence in us your presence among us and of your fire, Lord, in us and among us. Release the spirit of burning in our own hearts and our own minds among us to burn up the wood, the hay, the stubble. Burn up the chaff in me, Lord, in me, in us, Lord. Burn it up, Lord. Burn up, Lord, the hindrances and the walls and the barriers. Burn it up, Lord. Make our hearts to be a highway that you can gladly come into and dwell in, take up residency in. Come, Holy Spirit. You are welcome. You are welcome here among us. You are welcome. We welcome you this morning, Holy Spirit, among us as we welcome you in us.
Thank you, Lord. We give you permission, Lord, to emancipate us from all that is not of you, Lord, and is not you to free us, to circumcise our hearts and our minds. Burn, Lord, burn. Consuming fire that you are, O oh God, burn in me, burn in us. Burn. We ask for the spirit of repentance, the spirit of the Lord to rest upon us in this time. Thank you, Lord. Well, let's try to get started. I don't know what all that means or is going to mean today. I just want the Lord to have his way in me and in us, don't you? I want the Lord, I'll say it plainly, I want the Lord to be my government, to be our government, to absolutely and in every way have his way. I do not want to ever get in front of you, Lord, or hinder you. I ask for sensitivity to the power of your presence. You are God most high and there is none like you. You are the living one. You are the I am, Alpha, Omega, beginning, end, the goal. You are everything, Lord. We love your presence because we love you. And you are altogether awesome and beyond finding out. And yet you reveal yourself. And we're so grateful, Lord. We are grateful to you. Thankful. We are thankful, Lord. Well, amen. If you can say amen. Well, let's look at a few passages and... Uh, uh, starting uh, this morning in the Gospel of John. <clears throat> in the Gospel of Luke as well. Those two Gospels, Luke and John. Let's uh, read a little bit first out of Luke, kind of give the background here. And then we will um, go into John and a lot of scripture. Don't know how far we'll get into all that. I, um, because the scripture can be meaningless to my heart if I don't allow the Holy Spirit to unveil himself. I don't want that. Don't need it. Don't want it. Just want the Lord. But let's try to read a little bit out of Luke um, chapter 1. We'll begin with uh, verse 13. If I get through this without weeping, I'll be shocked. I... Uh, I want my heart sensitive, don't you guys? I do not want to be hardened towards the Lord. He is so far above 
and past my finding out. I cannot comprehend him, but he is awesome. I just want to know him. Though I cannot comprehend him, that makes him all the more wonderful. Though I do not fully understand, it makes him all the greater. I just want to know him as he is. So verse 13, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And then uh, John chapter 1, we'll look at uh, just a few passages here. Beginning with verse number 6, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for a witness that he might bear witness of the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came that he might bear witness of the light. And then, uh, I know we're skipping around quite a bit here, but let's uh, continue in this mode for a second <clears throat> and um, look further in chapter 1 here. Let's look at uh, verse uh, uh, 25 of chapter 1. And they asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered and, and them saying, I baptize in water. But among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, or the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him. But in order that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. And John bore witness, saying, I have beheld the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven. And he remained on him. And I did not recognize him. It's twice he says that. But he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Okay, let's just uh, start with those two passages. Um, and I want to speak to us a little bit around this theme this morning of a new time or a new season of time 
There's a little passage, you don't have to turn there with me if you don't want, but it's in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. I'll read it real quick to you. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. We could go on in that passage. I just want to point out two things about this chapter 5, verse 1 in 1 Thessalonians. There are two Greek words used in this passage that are, uh, have two very differing meanings as a reference to time. There's what's called times, which is a chronos, a uh, form of chronos, the Greek word chronos. That word basically means time that is measured by succession of events, or some would say linear time, but it's more specific than just the fact of linear time. It is a very specific measurement of linear time that is measured by the events that are going to transpire within that time. It's important that we understand, that's the only reason I bring this up, for our time as in all times of recovery, when God is recovering his testimony, it's important that we understand the meaning of this word and how it's used here by Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's not just linear time. It is a specific time that is... It is linear, but it's measured not for the fact that it's just ongoing. It is measured. It has a beginning and an end. And its measurements is the events or are the events that will transpire in that measured time. So we can think back on very specific scriptures and places throughout the history of God's dealings with his people where that has been true. It had something that had a very specific beginning when God was recovering his name, his testimony. It would have a very specific ending, that being the recovering of his testimony. That would be its end. The other word here, uh, more uh, uh, usable word as far as our understanding is the word kairos. That word is more translated as to an appointed Time. That's usually what you will hear about the word kairos, appointed time. But that has to be, I think, more specifically spoken of in this sense of appointed time, a season of accomplishment. Something is going to be accomplished. Something is going to be finished. When you look at the context of the passage here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it's in direct reference to the day of the Lord. And uh, so the day of the Lord being both. The day of the Lord is chronos time. It is a time where there will be, in a very real sense, a beginning. It is measured not just by, okay, it's so many 24-hour periods, so many months, so many years. Its measurement is actually the events that will happen in that time. These events are going to happen. And when I mean events, I'm really speaking of spiritual events in this sense. What God does to recover his testimony. His acts to draw our hearts and redemption purposes as well as involved in this, but to draw the hearts of his people in, or let's say it this way first, out of where there is a loss of his testimony and into the fullness of his testimony. And that's always going to be the dynamic with the Lord. I've said this before, I'll say it again. God will never allow his testimony to stay in a place of lowness. He will move by the Holy Spirit to recover his testimony, his name. Won't he? He will do that. So, um, so the measurement then of that time frame 
is seen in the very specific work of God. Thus the importance of knowing the season of time, if we're part of that, that we're living in. How do I align my heart with the Lord so that I don't hinder him, don't get in his way? But that's just one negative aspect. The positive side, how, Lord, because my heart is to be a part, to be a part with you, so aligned with you that we're vessels of the Lord in times of recovery. I'm not interested in just getting out of the way. Though, if I'm in the way, and that's all God needs to do, because I want my heart's not yielded, my heart's hard, then it's better that I get out of the way. But that's not our hearts, is it, brothers and sisters? Our hearts is participation. Participation. This is really true in this time. You will see this among God's people. And we'll see it uh, even among the lost in this sense. This is a time of discontentedness. It is good to be discontented with the present state of spiritual things. Wouldn't you agree? If things are not in the realm of God's full purpose, His full testimony, the fullness of His name among His people, I don't want to be content. I want to be discontent specifically as to that state of affairs. So this is a time of that. We're in a time such as what we're talking about here. And times of the past have been similar. We're in a time to where our hearts are discontented. I'm just going to say it with the state of the church. Anybody agree with me in that? Anybody in this room discontented? I'm looking at everything, and it's not meant to be critical. I'm looking at the United States of America, all of what's called the church in its present state. Is there anyone in this room that's content with it? Please don't raise your hand if you are content with it. I'm not saying that because you can't be there. I'm just saying I don't want you to get stoned by the people around you. (laughs) I'm I'm totally kidding. (laughs) For most of us, the majority of what and what I'm seeing as I travel, but it doesn't matter. All you got to do is just live life day to day and talk to people and get to know people. And if they have any church background, what you'll find among the lost is they don't like church because they have been hurt by church. And they cannot distinguish the difference between God and church. And we should all know this in this room. There's a massive distinction between God and what's called the church. Is that not true? It's true, isn't it, Mike? It's extraordinarily true. And for some of us, it's taken us how long, Mike? 30 years to learn that, of getting beat up, getting wore out. Isn't that right, Don and Valerie? It's absolutely right. Getting it taken to us, Jim and Ann. Isn't it true? We bear in our body the marks of our stupidity. (laughs) What do you mean by that, Terry? We should have ran a long time ago to the Lord and out of something. But anyway, I'm digressing there quickly. Lord, forgive me. My point being this, God is declaring a new time and season, a new thing. Again, it is not new to God. It is only new to us. It involves what is completely and forever his heart the fullness of the testimony of his son. That's only new to us, isn't it, Gary, if the testimony of his son has been lost. That would be the only reason it would be new. If the testimony of his son is not in the fullness of his name, then it would be new to me, new to us, new to this nation or at least components of it. 
So whenever the Lord begins to speak about new time, a new season, it is a chronos time. In it, if we can look historically at how God has moved to recover his name among a people of his name, of his possession, that's a bridal paradigm, isn't it? The wife gives up her name to take the name of the one she loves. Don't we do that? Aren't we supposed to do that? That's a something that God himself ordained to show eternal purpose through marriage. But that's marriage on the grounds of how God saw marriage. Not marriage on the ground that we have today in society to where it's two individuals, a husband and wife, fighting for who's in control. Forgive me for saying that, but let me say it again. <laughs> that was never marriage as God saw it. God should be in control of the marriage. And until that becomes the reality of things, we'll never have marriage on the ground that God ordained for it to be on. God should be in control of me. Isn't that true? God should be in control of us, husband and wife. God should be in control of family. And God should be in control of his family. He should be the government. Amen. I'm being very simple. I know I am. I'm not, it's not because I think we're simpletons. I'm just trying to be very clear in my remarks. That's the only reason I'm, I'm saying it this way. I want to be clear in my remarks. So that in as much as is possible, um, there can be understanding. To be in a time like this, a new time, where God is going to be doing the unfamiliar... It will challenge the familiar. Are we okay with that? Or do we want church, and I'm not talking about this building, because that's not the church. Church is only happening here today because the church showed up and walked in the door. <laughs> Isn't that true? Church is not a place we meet. Church is not a time that we meet. Church is not a way of meeting. It has never been that. Church is a people who are gathered in the name that is above every name. That is the church. And it's the only church that God recognizes, those who are gathered in his name. Whether they be two or three or two or three thousand or two or three million, it won't matter. It's the fact that they are gathered in the Lord. He is the gathering place of the Father. Christ himself is. And we have been gathered in his name, into him. The gathering place of all that will come out of Adam and be gathered in Christ. You're either gathered in the first man, Adam, and you were gathered into him without your choice in the matter. You were born there. Or you're born again and gathered in a new man, Christ. Amen. But even that's but a beginning. To be fully gathered is what we're after. We're after fullness, aren't we? I'm not after a little dab of Jesus to do me. I want the Lord. Brill cream, Brill, Brill cream may be a little dab, but Jesus is not a little dab. And if you just want your hair to look good, you're not going to like this church. <laughs> true, isn't it, Steve? Right, man, it's true. If you want the familiar, you've come to the wrong place. I can't be any clearer than that. Can I? Anybody want me to be clearer than that? This is about, not about the familiar. Brothers and sisters, the familiar is what the people in the world don't want any part of. Why would we want to replicate that? And the familiar is not how you do something. It is the presence of the Lord among us. The familiar is not being in a building. The familiar is the lack of the presence of God in that building.
The familiar is not the fact that we gather. The familiar is that we, it's a social gathering and not the gathering of God. I've been a part of home group meetings for over 20 years. And you know what is the fly in the ointment? Is that they're no different than meeting in a building without the presence of the Lord. It's not the where that makes the difference. It's who's among us. Lord, help us. We are creatures of habit, and God's about to break that. (laughs) Are we okay with it? I'm just being really as clear as I can about what it means for God to do a new thing. So let's read a few passages again, and then I'll come back and comment on all of it. And I don't know what time it is. Does anybody really care what time it is? Most of what I've been noticing when I'm traveling is I'm the only one that's caring what time it is these days. I'm thinking, Lord Almighty, what time is it? I can't see the clock in many of these conferences, and they won't let me see it for some reason. And I'm ready because I'm exhausted and ready to leave. And there it's 10:30, 11 o'clock at night, and they're still on their faces weeping before the Lord. And I say, Amen. I'm only warning out because I'm about, you know, here's the way it works, folks. The anointing presence of God has an effect on all of us, doesn't it? And it's an energizing effect. And when it when that presence lifts, though Christ is always in us, when that presence lifts, how many know that at that point all of us are like, drag me out of the building. (laughs) Carry me out, Mike. (laughs) I need help. Somebody. So anyway, all right, Isaiah 42. um, Okay, (laughs) 11.15. Means means I got at least an hour. <laughs> no, no, I'm playing. <laughs> All right, so verse 9 of Isaiah 42, starting with verse 9. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I de- declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. Sing to the Lord a new song. Notice in this passage that when God does a new thing... There's elements that are completely new because he's done a new thing. One of the first things mentioned is songs. This has been, anybody who studied church history knows this truth. Whenever God does a new thing, new songs are birthed. Many of the songs in the old hymn books, I say many, but a number of songs in our old hymn books, if any of us were ever in church growing up where you had a hymn book. Anybody ever in church where you had a hymn book? Did you know that many of the songs in the hymn book were beer drinking songs? Until the Lord came. Not in the pub, though sometimes in the pub. Truth of it, in fact, is this, folks. God can more quickly get into a pub than he can get into a religious service. At least somebody around the place has joy, not a sour pickle puss religious face. <laughs> it's really true, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, many of the songs were uh, thus just uh, adopted. They gave new words to what was already in existence. And um, so that's true of many of the songs out of the hymn book. These people had not known the Lord. When the Lord got a hold of them, they'd already been singing these songs in the pubs, the beer halls in Germany. And when they came to the Lord, their minds were renewed unto God, and they wrote some of the beautiful hymns that we have. So songs have always been a part of a move of God. God moving among his people. New songs come out of it. Sometimes entirely new music. 
comes out of it. So sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the end of the earth, you who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and those who dwell on them. Let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voices and settlements where Kader inhabits. Let the islands of Selah sing aloud. Let them shout for joy from the tops of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. Here's the, when there's a new thing that God is doing, here's what happens in verse 13. The Lord will go forth like a warrior. No, never make any mistake about this. When God is doing something new, he goes forth like a warrior. He will rouse his zeal like a man of war. Amen. Rise up, O God, among us. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. I've kept silent for a long time. I'm not in a silent mode these days. How about you? This is not a time. If the Lord is going to do and is beginning to do something new, this is not a time to be in the silent mode. It's not a time for our own will and our own way. It is a time of pronouncement. Let me say this. It's a time of declaration. Can you feel that in your heart? It's in a time. Time has changed. And I'll define that more as we go along in this. When, whenever God is doing a new thing, time has changed. Not in the 24-hour sense. In that God has risen up as a warrior. I will recover my testimony. I will have a people who will come out of to me from Babylon they will come out from the confusion of religion from the confusion of church they will come out to me I have arisen I could say this because some of the other passages I have arisen the Lord says this let the whole earth be silent amen fear of the Lord comes we need it I need it I'm asking for it he is not who we think he is. And we must not think that he can be contained and within my box. If you can box God in, and you can't, then you're greater than him. You're God. This is what C.S. Lewis said about Aslan. He is not a tame lion. And he will not be tamed. Religion has always sought to tame him. Uh, he's not tame. He comes out to break the fetters that's on his people. To emancipate his people. To free us. To bring us out of Babylon. Out of confusion. Out of make a name for yourself. Come out to me. All right, so notice the progression here in this. It's a progression in this passage of what, what, let's say it this way, a definition of a new thing. Is There's a progression in this passage. I've kept silent for a long time. I've kept still and restrained myself. Now like a woman in labor. See how travail is a part of it? Now like a woman in labor, I groan, I gasp, and pant. When God is about to birth His testimony in fullness, His name among a people, and thirdly, and mo perhaps most importantly, His glory in and among His people again. When that's going to be birthed, travail will be a part of it. Travail is a part of the birthing process in the spirit as well as in the natural. So I appreciate people on the floor, like I've been seeing, myself on the floor. I appreciate people pouring out their hearts to God. I appreciate, listen, 
the ugliness of God getting us off and under our own control. God has anything to do with what he's going to do. You and I are going to come off and under our own control. And I don't mean, on a, you know, out here, over here, I'm saying some point in the wrestling match with God, if we're going to wrestle, the better way is not wrestle. Just let him hit you. <laughs> if, if Jacob, I'm referring to Jacob wrestling all night with God. I don't know if there's a stupider passage in the Bible than a man wrestling all night with God. Mike, what kind of end am I expecting if I'm wrestling? You know he's going to hit you. There's a better way in this. Just let him hit you, and you will walk different for the rest of your life. You will never be the same person again if you let him hit you. Just let him strike you. Anything other than that, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't have fear for that. But anyway, I don't want to go down that path. Just take the blow. Life is filled with blows, including from the Lord in a good way. Transformation, listen, we think transformation is just this gradual, oh, 30 years from now, I might stop acting this one certain way. And that's our thoughts about transformation. God has a better plan than that. I'm going to strike you, Terry. And when you get up off the floor, however long that is... <laughs> You're going to see things. By seeing me, you're going to see other things in proper perspective and differently. I'm going to be in you, Terry, and entirely other than life. I'm going to energize you in a way you never even thought possible. See, we have this dialed down form of the life of God in us to where we can basically go on living our lives and yet, you know, Christ is supposed to be doing something through me. And I'm just wanting to say, when God does a new thing, he basically grabs hold of the knob called the life meter and goes, Ooh, like that, and you're just about to jump right out of your skin because all of a sudden he's not who I thought he was. And life just begins to come. And you see like you've never seen him. And all, if you, once you get up, you see things in proper perspective. You see the distinction between him and ourselves. Don't we? I want the Lord to grab the knob right in the center of my chest. Don't you, Karen? And go, mm, let me show you what life in Jesus is really about. I want that. All right, so verse 15, I will lay waste the mountains and the hills. These are the present high places that are in opposition to him, even in my mind, especially in my mind. And wither all their vegetation. Everything that's grown out of that high-mindedness in my understanding, God will wither it. I will make the rivers into coastlands. That means enlargement spiritually from a river to a coastland, the ocean being in view. I will lead the blind, that would be me. So he's referencing here, particularly his own people. Really is, there's a, there's a reason why I say that. We'll get to it, hopefully. I will lead the blind by way they do not know. In paths they do not know. Catch the significance of that statement. For God to do a new thing means we are not going to have ever experienced what is about to happen. May God lock that into our hearts. You know what is the bane of much of my thinking? Is do it, Lord, but do it within the box to where I'm safe and remain the same. He isn't going to do it, is he, Ruth? 
Why would you, it, we can't pray for God to do a new thing and then want it to come in a familiar package? Does anybody, hey, hey Ari, does anybody agree with me that that's just an impossibility? If God is going to do a new thing, it's going to come in a new way. And again, I'm not just talking about externals. But my experience of God is going to be challenged. What's actually occurring in much of what's happening is he's showing himself in a way that I have never known him. All my, let's just say this, all my 35 years of ministry experience is meaningless in that moment. Or it should be. If it's not, then I try to control it. Manipulate it. Make it into that that I want. I want it to be this way. Lord, don't let this get out of hand. If God has anything to do with it, he'll wrestle it, he'll wrestle it out of our hands. That's what this passage is saying. I'll lead the blind by a way they do not know and paths they do not know. I will guide them. I will be, make darkness into light before them. That's what he calls where we've been living. Without the revelation of him, without really seeing him as he is in a progressive way, it's an ongoing progression that has no end to it. God calls my understanding. Think about this. God calls what I understand about him right now spiritual blindness and darkness. He loves us, but I have to see it rightly. Am I okay with that? I'm okay with it, folks. I'm okay with what I don't know about him, which is pretty much everything. Why am I saying all this? Because to pronounce God's going to do a new thing needs to be more real to us than I'm going to have a few goosebumps. It needs to be more real to us than my, oh, I'm so joyous God's going to do a new thing. But when it hits and its full bruntness is so challenging, wait a minute, this is out of control. <laughs> And the angel of the Lord standing there, well, what do you think, jerk? You think it's going to stay in your control and be God? <laughs> amen. Uh, I appreciate your wonderful amens out there. It's just <laughs> astounding. <laughs> no, uh, this thing has to get out of our control to be in God's control. Has to be when he's doing a new thing. I'm trying to qualify that. When he's doing a new thing, it is altogether unfamiliar to us. Can I live with a consuming fire? Will become the question. That's burning up all the familiar in order to answer our own prayers. Again, being discontented should alert us to the need for a new thing. What are we discontented about? Well, Terry, I'm discontented about the way the church is. So why then am I complaining when he does something outside of my boundaries? Why am I complaining when he does something that doesn't look like anything I've ever seen? Why would I complain? Because he's got me on ground now that I've never stood on before. And I've never understood. And I've never beheld him in this way. And I've never seen him in this way. And he's altogether different to me. He's the same one. I'm just seeing a part of him I've never seen. So it would be utter foolish for me to be discontented with the present state of things, but completely resistant to his change, to his transformation, 
to his breaking those boundaries, to his emancipating us and freeing us. You see what I'm saying? So uh, the things that he's going to do, and he will not leave them undone, is his promise here in verse 16. Listen to that. These are the things I will do. I'm going, here's what the Lord's saying to us, I'm going to lead you in paths that you don't know. I'm going to guide you, though. But we won't be guided by our natural minds in that. We'll be led of the Spirit. Are we okay with that? Amen. The Spirit knows the deep things of God. I don't, but the Holy Spirit does. It's that path that he's going to lead us on. So, listen, to have a recovery of his testimony, to have a people gathered in his name for his glory, the glorious presence of God himself, the consuming fire that he is, to have what he wants that's what he's laying out here I'll make darkness into light before them the rugged places into plains these are the things I will do and I will not leave them undone they shall be turned back and be utterly put to shame who trust in idols who say to molten images, you are our gods. Hear, you deaf. So first he addresses blindness, spiritual blindness. Now spiritually deafness. You know God's not into us being spiritually blind and deaf. Amen. Can you say amen to that? He aims to have a people, John 15, who are not just slaves that know nothing, but friends who he can reveal his heart to who know his business, can participate with him. Hear you deaf and look you blind that you may see. Who is blind? There it is. Here's the definition. Who is blind? My servant. We've read that for years, haven't we, Mike? It's a hard thing to come to grips with for the Lord to say that to my heart. Terry, let me emancipate you from you. Let me draw you into the depths. Who is blind but my servant, or so deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is so blind as he that is at peace with me? Or so blind as the servant of the Lord. Then he defines it. Here's our past. That's why I brought this up this morning. Here's how the environment, here's how our past and what we've experienced and what we've known, even the victories of God, can set our hearts in a place that can concrete us into that place and make us unbending. can immobilize us from going on and going forward. I don't want it, do you? I don't want that. You've seen many things, but you do not observe them. Your ears are open, but none hear. So see, it's not a matter of natural seeing and hearing. That's the problem. He's defining it it's spiritually. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to make the law great and glorious. But this is a people plundered and despoiled. All of them, brace your heart for this, are trapped in caves or are hidden away in prisons. And he's not talking about natural things. He's talking about the prisons of our own hearts and minds. 
to the point that now we have enjoyed living. We've lived there so long. I've lived there so long in my prison, in my cave, that it's become home to me. And I judge everything else by the four walls of my prison. They have become a prey with none to deliver them and a spoil with none to say, give them back. But here's the glory of this passage. God has arisen like a warrior. And what he's doing is saying, give them back to me. They are mine. Then the question goes forth. It's a question to my heart this morning. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will give heed and listen hereafter? So... um, Now let's read real shortly here, Isaiah 43, verse 14. I'm going to say basically the same thing. In in fact, let's not read all of that. It'll take too long. Let's just start with verse 15. I am the Lord, your Holy One. This is Isaiah 43. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters. That has history to it, doesn't it? He led his people out of Egypt. Out of Egypt. Brought them out of Babylon. He brings us out of our captivity, out of our prison, out of our caves. When he does a new thing. We pass through. This is what's said of them going through the Red Sea, that they were all baptized. This is right out of the New Testament. In Corinthians, Paul says they were all baptized in the Red Sea. It was a symbolism. Did they understand it? No. Do I understand it? It's the real question. Here's my point. Part of God's way out is a fresh baptism. What we're going to see with the spirit and power of Elijah. A baptism of repentance. And with the Lamb's approach. A baptism of the Holy Spirit. And fire. It's all over the scriptures, brothers and sisters. So verse 18, now I'm skipping. Do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Why would God say that? Because if I want to live in the past, it will be a huge hindrance to what God aims to do today. If I let it be. Or I can live in the present with the Lord. There, listen, there's other than maybe some small children, there's not a one of us in this room that doesn't have a past. Wouldn't you agree? Anybody in this room have a religious past that you just soon forget about? Anybody? I want to see your hands. You might have a religious past in this room you just soon forget about. Whatever. I'm not just talking about Christianity. Whatever it is, a religious past that you just soon, well, God's brought me out of that. He's not, but he's not done bringing us out. It's not a one-time act that he's after. It's a relationship. Is that not true? So he's always bringing me out. He's always leading me beside still waters. He's always restoring my soul in the partaking of the Lord himself. It is always a journey forward and never st- stagnation. Stagnation is anathema to us. We don't come into a place and say, man, I've got him and can't wait for heaven. God is always on the move. He's always wanting to reveal himself, to make a people of his own name, to wherever that people are scattered throughout the earth. His name, his glory, his testimony is there. Amen.
It's always a progression in this thing. Can you feel that in your spirit for a second? God would move us on from what we've known. God would move us on from this place. You say, but I, and like myself, I've experienced the good, the bad, and the ugly. All of us have. And I appreciated the good, but he's moving us even on from the good. The good will be the enemy of the best if we don't go on. Isn't that true, Steve? It's absolutely true. Angela, you know it. I don't, it doesn't matter how good it has been in the past. I cannot live on the fumes of yesterday's experience with God. I must know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. He would move us on from here. From glory to glory to glory to glory is what the scripture proclaims about it. Ever increasing glory of the Lord. So there's no place to pull over into the rest area and say, I'm done. Pick me up. When you go up, grab my hand and I'll go up with you. <laughs> Not likely. We're talking about something beyond just the fact of getting to heaven here. We're talking about becoming something of a bride in the here and the now. And being, let's say it this way, making ourselves ready for him and being made, made ready for him. Both are true. And it demands my involvement in it. Doesn't it? So, what time is it now, Nathaniel? <laughs> All that was background. <laughs> Just to get to the point. <laughs> All that's background. It's the day of the Lord. Thank you. And it's a long day, isn't it? <laughs> it's not a quick one. So there's so much more that I need the Lord to say to me about that fact. But I want to say that. I want to make some proclamations. It may be hard to hear it, but hear it we must. Why, Terry, must we hear it? Because of the time we're in. I'm not interested. I just want to, I, I love you guys too much to go out and say what I'm saying out there without bringing it right here. I'm seeing what I've never seen in my entire life out there. I'm not kidding you. I'm seeing the power of the presence of God come in ways I have never seen. I've wanted and prayed and asked for years with expectation that that would be true. It's not because of me. That's not why I'm bringing this up. It's a common thing, and I'm, I'm trying to explain it in this sense. We are in a new time. We are in a new season. I've been alerted by spiritual encounter to this fact. Listen, it is, we're not in the same time we were a month ago. It may seem dramatic, but I just have to say it to you. It's true. April has brought with it, this April has brought with it a change of time. I'm not the only one saying this either. I've been saying it, but had confirmation to some of this from my good friend Neville Johnson, who lives in Australia, and he and I, because of he's been sick for nine months, we've not had a chance to talk in the last two or three months. Talked to him the other day, though. Both of us were so anxious to share some things that the Lord has been saying. I have to say to you that we are not in the same time we were a month ago. God has changed time in this sense, though I want to explain to you what I mean. The 24-hour day out there is not what's changed. May is going to come. Behind that, that, June is coming. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in Kronos time, a specific period of time that has a beginning will be measured by the events of God in that time, what he will do. And what we'll discover in this, biblically he said he would do in that time. It's that time. 
that I'm referring to. We have known this for so many years, those of us who have uh, just read, studied the scriptures, which hopefully is all of us in this room. So those of us who have done that have known that there was a change going to occur. So we'll see some of this in Malachi. I'll read a little bit of it. And then try to pull some of this stuff together. Verse 1 of Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I am going to send my messenger. Does this refer to John the Baptist? Yes. Is it fulfilled in its entirety in John the Baptist? No. Was John the Baptist a messenger preparing the way? Yes. Did he completely fulfill Isaiah 40? No. Are these promises and many others, I'm just looking at a few here, cyclical? Yes. Because the Bible's not just a history lesson of things that happened in the past. more than that I've read this passage to you before Romans chapter 15 now these things were written these scriptures were written for us God is going to take what we're seeing here and those of us who've read and studied the scripture have understood this for years these passages in a new cycle of time, he will take these passages and bring them into a fullness, even a greater fullness. And if we're dealing with the end of an age, if we are, this is just true. The greatest fulfillment then of that passage, I'm saying this, the Lord in the fullness of himself and the enemy in the fullness of himself in a cataclysmic end showdown where God finishes crushing the head of the serpent. So behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Now this, well, this means us, the temple of God. We, his temple. Explains this further. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly, notice that, suddenly, there's going to be and there he is. I'm watching it. A suddenness to this. I've been astounded by how suddenly people can go in a congregation from one moment looking like deer caught in headlights to the next moment us own our faces by no one's, oh, everybody hit their face. No, no, no. Own their faces weeping in uncontrollable ways before the Lord. The spirit of burning on us. Nobody wanting to leave. Harley riders, how do you know that? Because they got all, I'm just telling you, they got all their stuff curled up in fetal positions on the floor and they can't get up. God's penned us. And the spirit of that fire. The presence of the Lord is what I'm talking about. God the consuming fire among his people. And the power of that fire is the power of God. I'm watching it. Miracles and healings taking place. I'm not exaggerating. I'm just telling you what's going on. I feel like I got a tiger by the tail. 
There's teeth on the other end. He is, and listen, it's really a lion. He is not tame, but he's glorious. So much going on in the meetings. There's a flow in God that I've never witnessed before ever. In all of my time with the Lord, I've never seen that type of flow. I've never seen a flow of that power of fire of the presence of God among a people. Never seen, never seen the release of the Lord in that way that's going on. Unparalleled. Things going on. It, I mean, whole sections of people. You know, you're not talking about one or two. Just whole sections of people under the fire of God. You simply watch it amazed. I'm no more any more amazed than me in the meeting. Watching it. People miraculously healed. Don't even touch them. Doesn't matter. God's doing what he's doing. People delivered of things. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm setting the stage for you. That's all I'm trying to say. This isn't isolated. It has begun. And a number of people that I know personally. The Lord suddenly comes among his people in power and fire. I tell you, there's no substitute for the presence of God. It doesn't matter what we have. We don't have the presence of the Lord among us. What's the use of being together? What's the use of coming together? And if we're alone out there, but the presence of God, and I mean not just the fact, okay, yeah, there's the fact he's in me, and then there's that that has something beyond that attached to it. Yes, factually, he's in me, but I'm telling you, he is a consuming fire. And you know, and I know, and that is the truth. Unparalleled, unparalleled releases of God goes on. Feel it rising in the room. I can see in the room the fire of God rising on us. Spirit of burning released on us. It is his time. It is his purpose. It is his heart. My heart is burn, baby, burn. That's my heart. That's my heart in this. Burn, burn, Lord. Burn in me. Consuming fire. Burn in and among us. Consuming fire. Burn the wood, the hay, the stubble. Burn the dross as it says here. Burn, refine me. Spirit of burning and repentance hit my heart. I'm not talking about things he's forgiven us of of the past. I'm talking about my lack right now of his presence and his glory, of his having his own testimony, of his of people of his own name, of his glory among his people. Spirit of burning, the Lord is a consuming fire. And who can live with a consuming fire? Only those who will be the burning ones with him. It's the only way to live. It's the only way to survive in that sense with a consuming fire is become one with him in it. You with me on that? How many with me say, Terry, man, I want a, the Lord to burn in me. I do. So, and the messenger of the covenant in whom I delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand? That's why so many are falling. I fall. We're falling because who can stand? I know that's not just a physical thing. But the power of it is so real on the inside that our body simply gives way in this thing. He is greater inside than what our body can take. I'm watching it transpire in that way. Who can stand when he appears? I want the fear of God in that way in my life. I don't want to be stubborn. I don't want to be insensitive. I don't want to be unyielding. But I'm telling you there's a fear, a healthy fear, reverential fear of God that is coming. Amen to it. So, all right. For he is like a refiner's fire and a launderer's or fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter. Purify, purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold. See, it comes among the priesthood. There's a royal priesthood in this that we all are meant to be. 
brothers and sisters, just appeal to your hearts. Can we give God what he wants as a people? This region, I'm talking about Nashville now, God wants a testimony of himself coming up out of the city of Nashville, the region of Nashville, that is pure. The eyes of the Lord are looking for a people. Will we be that people? The Lord showed me back some months ago a vision of six swords pointing towards the city of Nashville. I don't think I've shared this publicly. I I haven't have a... Six swords were pointing towards the city of Nashville all along the interstate routes. Interstate 40, both sides of Nashville, two of the swords. Interstate 65, both sides of north and south of Nashville, pointing towards the city of Nashville. The handles and their location, I could see very, very clearly. Interstate 24, both sides of Nashville, six swords. 